Interpretation of the Inductor's Response The interpretation of the complete response of a storage element like the RC has already been discussed in great detail. For the 7N RC response. Because of this, I'll say that now we will briefly summarize those interpretations applied to the Norton RL response. We don't need to redo all of the details. Once again, this is a summary. So I'm only going to do two things. The first thing that I'm going to look at is that I'm going to look at the, the storing and the decaying inductor response. This follows very closely to the capacitor one. So let's do this very lightly. A storing inductor has its initial value I L of zero minus smaller than its final value I short circuit. The bracket term. in the response, and remember, when we write the response, it should be I L of T, I short circuit plus the bracket term of I L of zero minus I short circuit e to the minus T, excuse me, e to the minus T tau, is negative. Since I short circuit is larger than I, you know, then since I initial, it's got to be larger. So in other words, we're saying that if I look at this bracket term, I L of zero minus minus I short circuit, and if I define this as delta I, nope, I'm not going to define this as delta I. This guy has to be less than, than zero. 
So now, define the bracket term as delta i is then going to be the magnitude of the initial minus the final steady state value. So now if I define this in this way, the storing response is I L of T, which will then equal I short circuit, and then I'm gonna get delta I E to the minus T over tau, but now there is a minus sign in here. So this here is the storing response. On the other hand, a decaying inductor has I L of zero minus larger than I short circuit, the final steady state with the decaying response equal to I L of T, which will then be I short circuit. Again, I have those other terms as before, but now this is a plus sign. This is the the cane response. So we could now summarize from our other stuff here. So we could say that in summary, we know two things. One, we know that the the minus sign implies a storing inductor. In other words, it's increasing its current in the inductor. The other thing that we know is that if you have a plus sign or a positive sign, that implies that you have a decaying current in the inductor. So what we did last time is we said that if we plot this graphically, so graphically, this appears as the following. So let's plot this. So I'm going to go, let's say I do four squares. And this guy's going to be I L of T. And of course, this is going to be time. So since I need to do this twice, I'm going to copy this and place this guy over here. So when I look at these two situations, what am I seeing here? This is going to be a storing inductor. This is going to be a decaying inductor. Even though I said this multiple times, when I say storing inductor, I mean 
It's storing current in the inductor. It's storing more current than the inductor. A decaying inductor implies that the current is decaying in the inductor. So I could imagine that I have an initial inductor current that's going to be low in the storing. And then I have a higher inductor initial current. And what's going to happen? With the storing inductor, it's going to go to a higher current. So if I now start to follow this around, we are then going to see here that this one is going to increase in current. So if I follow the increase, we can see that the current has now changed by delta i, and this is an increase. So I am seeing a positive jump for the inductor current. That's what that minus sign means here. Second of all, if I have a decaying current, that decays to a lower I short circuit here. So again, following these two initial and final steady states, then I would expect in this situation that I'm going to have a decaying current. So if I look at the difference between these two, the, between the top and the bottom, we then say that this is delta I and this is a decrease. So the positive sign implies that I have a downward shift in the current here. So that's what it looks like graphically. Now, the last thing that we want to talk about is we want to talk about two, the intuitive complete response description. Now we spent a significant amount of time on the RC. So once again, we're just gonna jump to the little details that we actually see about this. So when I look at the intuitive, it's, it's not the way you wanna do it mathematically, but it's the way you wanna do it physically. So here we go. We learned from the capacitors complete response. And of course, that's of the voltage. The intuitive approach led to where we have I L of T, this is going to be to the initial state of the current. And that initial state essentially says, what is the reaction if there's no source present in the circuit? So that decays exponentially. And then finally, we have I final, and this is the response if only there was a source in the circuit. So when I'm looking at this, these two pieces is what we have been calling the natural response. And then this guy is the 
force response. So summarizing these, these definitions or summarizing the key points, this is what we found. One, we found, actually, I'm going to move this over. We're going to say, one, we found that the natural response, which is defined as I initial, e to the minus t over tau is the automatic reaction of the inductor if there is no source present. One way to look at that is that you could imagine that you have a completely saturated inductor and then you disconnect the power supply without shorting the inductor and then what happens here is that the resistance and the circuit will naturally decay the current. That's what you're seeing in this situation. So as an analogy, or as an example, suppose there is a saturated inductor that is disconnected from the power supply. The inductor will naturally respond by decaying its current via resistive heating. That's how it would behave. Now, if I go to the next one here, if I talk about the force response, we define that as IF times the quantity one minus E to the minus T over tau is the direct response when an external source is present with no initial condition. In other words, it ignores the, the uh, it starts from zero. It's just, what is this thing forced to do? It's only about the source. So then finally, the complete response
which is now a combination of both, is the superposition the superposition of both of these individual responses. Graphically, it describes best this superposition. So we've done this before, and it looks something like this. So we're going to have, I'm going to say, I'm going to try to not squish this down. And this is going to be the inductor current. And of course, this is going to be time. So look at the initial response. It's exponential and decay. So all systems should have an ex exponential decay initial condition. So in our situation, we could imagine that I have my initial condition, which is going to be I L of zero minus, and if left alone, this guy is going to decay. And this is what we call the natural response. Now, what we know is that this thing is going to go to its final steady state. So in this situation, we're going to say that this is I short circuit. And so when I look at I short circuit, we know that it has to reach this point like this. So what does the force response do? The force response charges from zero with no initial condition, and it reaches this so-called I short circuit value. So this right here is the forced response. Now I have a superposition of the green and the red. That forces this guy at zero to have some initial condition right here, and then this eventually matches up exactly with the that there. So this right here is the complete response. And graphically, like I said, it shows it the best.